I hate women. I'm having an official month of disrespect. Sometimes it's fun to just go wild and rape a hundred girls, rape the whole flat to teach them all a lesson. Which girl at uni would you like to pin down the most? And I just remember reading that and seeing all of our names listed. Oh God, I would hate to be in the firing line if I had a vagina. BBC Newsbeat. Hashtag shame on you Warwick. New revelations about the Warwick University online rape case. I haven't seen such horrific content like that. I don't understand how the university were willing to let these people return to campus. The pure, unadulterated misogyny that ran through that, I would never class as banter. People start to worry about the reputation of the university. People going on radio, tweeting, saying, I'm not sending my daughter there. My son is not going to go there in September. People start to panic. I don't feel like I could say to a parent, your daughter should come to our university when they won't be guaranteed their safety. Right here! This is say anything that's actually a threat. This is it, if that's what you need. One of them sent me a message saying, like, you can't let these screenshots get out because there's going to be severe consequences for all of us. Do it, then ditch her in a field covered in your cum from head to toe. I was so happy. I remember I cried in happiness when I got my results because I was going to... I always wanted to go to Warwick. <laughs> It was my first choice and um, I was really, really excited. On A-level results day, many students join group chats on platforms like Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. Joining a chat group is really important because it gives you that sense of not being alone when you're starting university. Once you've actually met each other, you then get your friendship groups forming. We'd all mess around in the library together, get lunch together all the time, just like 99% of the time. They were just your normal university guys, just always the life and soul of every event. They used to speak about it in front of us. They used to tell us like anecdotes from what they'd been talking about in their lads chat. I'd sometimes ask like, oh, like, are you going to let us see what you guys chat about us? And they're like, oh, you won't care. Like, it's just a football chat. Anna was close friends with one of the members of the lads chat group. We went on holidays together. He's come to my family home at Christmas time. Yeah, we were very close. We were sat in my apartment and he had his laptop out and he kept getting all of these messages through from this other mixed group chat. Obviously, I could see them popping through and they were not nice messages and he just laughed at me and he said, well, if you think that's bad, you might want to see our lads chat. Yeah, he then proceeded to show me the lads group chat as if he was showing off, as if it was something that he should have been proud of and that I was going to be impressed by how vulgar and horrendous it was. That's when he took me through a year and a half worth of rape threats. I swear to God, if it's that girl in my flat, I'm going to go all 1945 advancing Soviet army on her and rape her in the street whilst everybody watches. Rape her and run. I think I would have disabled her. Ha ha ha, knock her out the stupid slut. I was just taking pictures of the screen as he was scrolling. He sat next to me while I was doing it. I just told him that it was for my own peace of mind and he said it was okay. I noticed that a lot of the conversation that was surrounding me and my friends was about rape and gang rape and genital mutilation. So I searched my own name, it was coming up like hundreds of times. I think that he could see me getting more upset and more upset and I think that's when it started to dawn on him that this was probably a lot more serious than he thought it was. He then offered to stay over at Anna's flat. He said this was to make sure she was okay. I think he thought while he was staying in close proximity with me that he could kind of monitor my movements and, and manipulate me into thinking that it wasn't that bad. It's just a joke. You don't understand this is how boys talk. I can't afford Johnny's at the moment. You may as well just rape her and dash, then it will be cheaper. I get a phone call from her saying, you have to come over, like we found something, like you need to, you need to get here now. We'd sat there for about probably an hour at least just looking through all these screenshots of these disgusting messages. One of the boys said, 
which girl at uni would you like to pin down the most? And I just remember reading that and seeing all of our names listed. I, it was one, it was a really, really difficult thing to read because these are men who you've put in such a position of trust and you hold in such high regard, but they make a game out of raping and sexually assaulting you. The despicableness of what, what some people tried to class as banter, that I would never class as banter. It, you know, the pure, unadulterated misogyny that ran through that, the threats that were being made, um, were sickening. Yeah, they were talking about drugging people on nights out, and there was a particular conversation where they were talking about how one of them had drugged another female student. The university would later decide that one sexually explicit video shared in the chat needed to be handed to the police. West Midlands sent specialist officers to investigate the chat, but told the BBC, having considered the wishes of those affected, no formal police action will be taken at this stage. If you're making something so normalised to talk about, such as rape, you are creating an environment in which you're telling that, them that that's okay. While the women mentioned in the messages were deciding what to do, word about the lads' chat was already spreading. More and more girls started to find out through various means what was going on. Someone pulled us to one side and they said, oh, by the way, guys, there's this story happening. There's a group chat involving some students. Uh, you might want to take a look at it. The more that people started to talk about it, the angrier that the men got that this was starting to come out. One of them, who I was especially close with, actually sent me a message saying, like, you can't let these screenshots get out because there's going to be severe consequences for all of us. Like, no one else can see this. I didn't know what to do because these people were a huge part of my life and I didn't want to lose my friends. Um, it was giving me a lot of anxiety and panic attacks and that's when I decided that I was going to have to complain because otherwise I couldn't go back to university. I felt like I should have said something and I was so happy that someone was doing something at least. So whilst I didn't put a complaint forward, in the end I wrote a statement. All universities have a student complaint system. These allow students to report offences that break university rules and codes of conduct. They've got a um, dignity in Warwick policy that addresses the issue of social networking. I'm not sure, to be honest, how many students have actually read this document. Often they're hidden deep in the bowels of the university website. On the 25th of April 2018, Anna and another woman discussed in the chat submitted a formal complaint. Two days later, at 10.09pm on a Friday, Anna received an email from a man called Peter Dunn. Dear Anna, I have been appointed to act as the investigating officer regarding your formal complaint. So please forgive the relatively short notice and this evening email but would you be available to attend an interview with me on Tuesday the 1st of May at 9.30 a.m. in University House? That victim needs time to digest, time to understand, and time to get the appropriate support herself to help her through that process. If you receive something that completely shocks you and you're without support across the weekend and you're about to face it early next week, what, what's the likely impact of that? I mean, quite frankly, the lucky the individual didn't just say, I've had enough. The email also revealed that Peter Dunn's main job was as the University of Warwick's Director of Press. So, I want to make a comment. His responsibilities include issuing press releases, dealing with the media, and looking after Warwick's reputation as one of the top universities in the UK. Well, we knew there was a link with the press office as soon as we got the documents, and that was a problem. But you can imagine a situation where the press officer thinks, well, I think the just thing to do would be to do this. But if I put my press officer hat on, that won't look good in terms of their perception and the reputation of the university. And in order to avoid that risk 
my view is that it would have been prudent and wise to pick somebody who didn't have these two potentially conflicting hats. As the investigation got underway, 11 men involved in the chat were suspended from campus, pending Peter Dunn's inquiries. Yes, you put it up. Yeah, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. Meanwhile, the Warwick Boar, the university student newspaper, managed to get hold of screenshots of the chat and information about the investigation. Everyone was on board and we clicked publish. And that moment I remember vividly. And then looking at the page views on the website, just seeing it blow up completely. As media interest in the story increased, Peter Dunn's role as both investigating officer and director of press started to concern the two women who had complained. When the first news story started to break, we were told that he would delegate his press role to other members of the press team while he was working on this investigation. But emails seen by the BBC suggest Peter Dunn was still continuing in his press role. Dear Anna, as you might imagine, we are now being asked by a number of journalists if all 11 precautionary suspensions still stand. Obviously, we cannot continue to simply ignore those questions. I therefore intend to issue a press statement in response. It was a very surreal experience for us to be receiving draft press statements and investigatory notes from the same person. Throughout the disciplinary process, the university has defended its decision to appoint Peter Dunn as the investigating officer and denied he had a conflict of interest. I was just going with 94 pages of evidence and hoping that they could help me because I didn't know what to do. Having been called for interview late on a Friday night, Anna arrived on campus on the following Tuesday morning to meet Peter Dunn. He was very accusatory from the beginning in the way that he was questioning us. And um, we were told straight away that our stories didn't line up, which was very, I was very scared. I remember coming out of that meeting crying. I mean, I find this all the time, that students are invited to hearings or interviews, whether it's something like this or they've been accused of cheating or something like that. And they are completely shocked at what happens in the interview. They're just not... They didn't expect that level of scrutiny or even aggression and so on. He went through it one by one and asked me if I had any sexual relations with any of them. He made me go through every single page and he asked me, how did that make you feel? And the things that he was talking me through and he was asking me to repeat were very, very, very violent rape threats against me and my friends. The BBC has seen the interview notes taken from the meetings between Peter Dunn and the two women. Anna was asked about the reference to her and in Prague. Anna said they were not in a relationship at the time. Anna thought that the chat that said, rape the whole flat, teach them a lesson, referred to. Anna thought that rape the limbless freak referred to. Anna said that the quote, mate, the first time you fuck her, is a reference to. It's plain that if you are going to have an investigator go down a particular line where you're asking about sexual history and so on, that they're adequately trained to deal with these issues and to ask these questions sensitively and compassionately. I think you need to ask in a way that absolutely conveys belief and preferably having a gender that the individual chooses as the investigating officer. We asked the University of Warwick for information on any training Peter Dunn had received, but they refused to provide any details, saying it would be a breach of his privacy. I started to feel like I was under investigation and that I was being put on trial for coming forward about this. Peter Dunn would later put in writing that Anna's account of events revealed Deeply worrying facts that undermine the credibility of Anna as a witness at several, if not all, key points of these events. I, I, I'm, I'm not aware of why you would say you're not a credible witness. You will not remember exact times and dates necessarily. You know, 
so much depends on how traumatised you've been by what's happened to you. Anna was never provided with the full evidence as to why Peter Dunn felt this was the case. The university has told the BBC, we continue to support the investigating officer for this case, Peter Dunn, and we appreciate there are legitimate questions raised about the university's handling of this extremely delicate case. Honestly, at the start of this, I really did have a lot of trust in my university that they'd be able to deal with it properly. And that was completely, completely broken down at every single point. Like, every single time I thought that it couldn't get worse, it would get worse. After Peter Dunn had interviewed the women, he then interviewed each of the 11 men mentioned in the complaint. These interviews led to a new discovery. One of the men accidentally revealed that after the chat had been shut down, a second group was set up. The new chat was called Boys 2.0. If you open this chat when you are not in it, you are asking to be offended. Let's do it all again. Read some of my chats from home. This was literally nothing compared to them. Were they expecting compliments or something? Peter Dunn felt that these messages revealed in stark detail some of the men's lack of remorse. This became a key part of the report he then compiled on the case. In that report, Peter Dunn gave his recommendations for how each man should be disciplined. Out of the 11 men, he found that two had not done anything wrong. Three more were deemed to have committed minor disciplinary offences. Examples of minor offences at Warwick University include ignoring no smoking areas and bringing shopping trolleys onto campus. The two women at the heart of the complaint brought this up when they confronted one high-ranking university official about the disciplinary process. So why is it being considered the same as bringing a shopping trolley from Tesco onto campus? You have done what you're saying it's a minor. That you have literally done that. Is the one that made this threatening by showing it to me. He made that an active threat by showing me that someone wanted to rape me. Here, right here. This is say anything that's actually a threat. This is it, if that's what you need. This left six more men. Peter Dunn recommended that they had all committed major disciplinary offences. That meant they would have to appear before a disciplinary panel. These are made up of university staff, academics and student representatives. One of them was Hope Warsdale, then Student Union President. We are literally just kind of sent an email saying this is being convened on this date at this time, we need you to nominate two kind of representatives. And so it's kind of first and foremost who is actually available to be able to do this. Hope sat on the first day of the panel. We were just in a room in main kind of like university building in a sort of round table. People kind of just sat all around it basically. And yeah, I think it's, it's an incredibly tense situation to be in because that is, you know, the f certainly the first time for me that I was directly communicating with anyone that had been, you know, kind of accused within this case. One at a time, the men would appear before the panel, give a statement and then respond to questions. Is there kind of a genuine sense of remorse for what's happened? Is there a genuine understanding for why this is so severe? They know what the charges are against them and therefore the severity of them. They know what the potential range of penalties is that could be kind of applied to them. And they, I imagine they probably had an idea that it would come towards the more sort of severe end. It took two days to question all the men, at which point the panel agreed on a range of punishments. It was kind of tiring, but I think also came out of it feeling like you know, we've done what we need to do, basically, and that these are kind of, this is a range of penalties, including some incredibly, or well, sort of the harshest penalties you can get. In June 2018, the university announced the results of the disciplinary hearing. One of the men was banned from the university for life. Two of the men received bans of 10 years. Two were banned for one year, and the sixth man's case was deemed not proven. We were never told the outcomes of the disciplinary procedure, I found out when the press found out. Some people were satisfied. I remember some people saying the university had handled it quite well. Um, they'd taken a, a tough stance. There's always a constant anxiety and constant fear that you don't know when you're going to see these people. Obviously they were still anger that this had happened in the first place um, and that kind of stuff could happen at Warwick. But I think there was a sense of, okay, putting it to bed almost. 
The women knew the men would have the chance to appeal against their punishments, and the two who received 10-year bans decided to do so. Four months passed before the women heard the outcome of those appeals, something the university partly put down to a staff member taking a late summer holiday. It's a horrendous process to go through and for it to be so elongated would be really insensitive and inappropriate. Um, I also think that, you know, it's a question of priority for me. You know, if you prioritise something, then you get it done in a timely fashion. The result of the appeal saw the two men have their 10-year bans reduced to just one year. We heard about the outcome of the appeals before the actual complainants. And that's a recurring theme throughout the whole of this story. We hear things before they do. I was never given an explanation. Um, we were told that new evidence had come to light and that's why the sentence had been reduced from 10 years to one. But I don't know what the new evidence is. This meant the two men would be returning in 2019, when some of the girls affected by the chat, like Nicole, would still be studying at the university. No one in the administration or the people dealing with the case ever contacted me about this. Back then, no, I didn't feel like I was being heard. I didn't want to go back. I was in the middle of a year abroad, finally a world away from this nightmare that had completely ruined my second year of university for me, completely destroyed my friendship group and had left me with anxiety. Um, I didn't want to come back to that. The appeals panel had been made up of academics and student representatives with no prior connections to the case. This meant that those that gave the original punishments, like Hope Warsdale, weren't included. I just felt very confused, um, very frustrated. People have been expelled, like the harshest possible punishment in some cases which reflects the severity of the situation. Obviously, yeah, then, then that was essentially undone. The university has been very not transparent about kind of like the reasons why. The university has said the new sentences made the punishments comparable across all of those individuals sanctioned. By Christmas 2018, the university had confirmed that they had officially closed the investigation. At the start of term in 2019, the outcome of the appeals was beginning to spread around campus. One of the girls that was involved, she'd found out that the appeals had gone through and she decided to take to Twitter and put some of the screenshots up. When I used the hashtag shame on you Warwick initially, I thought this is showing that Warwick, you will not be able to get away with this, like we will not be ignored. That's the kind of moment that it all blew up and got the attention that it deserved and it became a bigger story than the original story. BBC Newsbeat. Hashtag shame on you Warwick. New revelations about the Warwick University online rape case. Now in the last few moments we've got a response from Warwick University. They've apologised that their processes have distressed so many people. It wasn't just students who were critical of the university's decision. Many staff at Warwick felt the same. I sent out a, an irate tweet in which I, I said that I will not promote the university at UCAS events. I will not encourage students to come to this university when they won't be guaranteed their safety. We started to have all of this support that I'd never been provided by my university. I'd never had anyone to talk to about it and now suddenly I had thousands of people giving me support from across the country, which was lovely. <laughs> I wanted this hashtag and all the attention to take the very system that w was going to allow these men back on campus. I wanted that to bring that system down. It was shame. I think the shame on you Warwick hashtag was, was absolutely accurate. I was ashamed to be part of a university that would so quickly abandon the victims in a case like this. Whereas the first story we broke in May, the anger was directed at the nature of the group chat. This time around, it, the anger was fully directed at the university, at their decisions, at how the disciplinary process, according to some people, has failed. 
departments at the university were distancing themselves from management at the university. Originally, the English department put out a letter to say they disagreed with what had happened, and then that started snowballing. I was on the march um, with, with the students. It was very much a positive vibe of, of wanting to enact real positive change and wanting to support those people who have been let down in this situation. This university has failed in its duty of care, not only to me, but to every survivor of sexual violence that walks around on this campus, to every student that has ever Two days before the protest, Stuart Croft, the Vice-Chancellor, announced that the two men who'd had their sentences reduced would no longer be returning to the university. They themselves have said, as I understand it, that they will not take up their places at the university. There's nothing to prevent them changing their mind. If you speak to basically any student, particularly any female student, they will be able to tell you the types of things that they experience on a daily, weekly, monthly basis at university that definitely feed into this kind of issue of rape culture, um, whether it's words or whether it's actual actions. It's the biggest story about Warwick in recent history. Um, it kind of puts a cloud over the university. It's on their Wikipedia page now, so it's there for good. At the time, Warwick released a statement saying it was deeply sorry and understood the distress that this had caused the victims of this abuse. It then announced an independent review of disciplinary procedures. When the BBC approached the university during the making of this film, it said, We are committed to ensuring the safety of the Warwick community and we take complaints of sexual misconduct extremely seriously. We hope that the publication of the outcome of our reviews in summer 2019 will enable the university to seek to answer those concerns, demonstrate our learnings and help our community to better live our values. They absolutely are speaking out their support of a zero tolerance around sexual misconduct. How you then get that zero tolerance into action that will be what we have to judge by. It may be that one of the silver linings of this case in Warwick is that universities will suddenly realise the importance of doing a professional job when it comes to investigations and hearings and appeals. While the Warwick group chat is the most high profile case, it's not the only one. In the last year, students at Loughborough, Exeter, Bournemouth and Sheffield have been investigated, suspended or expelled in similar cases. And during the making of this film, another case was exposed at Warwick. We are seeing far more women and girls stepping forward and going, we will not tolerate this. And they're being supported by their male peers. I see movement now that I haven't seen over the last 40 years, and it feels timely. So I don't think any university, any institution can afford to get this wrong. It's not acceptable to have an amateurish system when day in, day out, there are students out there who are the victims of injustice at university hearings and their lives uh, and their careers are being affected by poor decisions taken by university appeal panels. It's had such an impact on me as a person. It's had such an impact on the wider student community and I'm sure it's had an impact on them. But I don't understand what it was all for, so I just, I just want to know why. We were completely objectified and sexualised to the point where it was almost a ranking system of which girl was more desirable to rape. And having these guys who were also my best friends at the hands of that was a really, really hurtful thing to see. And it, it still gets to me, it still does. Is that, was that? Okay.